This is the USS North Carolina. Men called her the showboat. Once she was the most powerful battleship in the world. Today, she rests here in Wilmington, North Carolina, a memorial to the 10,000 men and women from her state who gave their lives in World War II. A quarter of a million people visit her each year, some with their own memories of her war, others to learn the way it was. For both, this film will show largely in authentic combat photography and tell by men who actually served in her the true story of a battleship at war. should begin like so many others that changed our world on December the 7th, 1941. That quiet Sunday found the new battleship North Carolina at New York Navy Yard following a long period of sea trials and shakedown training. Here comes the show, here comes the show, Frequent dramatic appearances of this great new battle wagon in New York Harbor had earned her the nickname, The Showboat, a name that would stay with her during four years of war in the Pacific. At Honolulu and Waikiki Beach, that fateful December weekend had begun with the usual island fair of carefree relaxation. But that same Sunday, Japanese aircraft carriers were launching their planes in the sneak attack that blasted the United States into World War II. Pacific fleet almost wiped out in a single stroke. The first half of 1942 saw the Japanese advance all across the Pacific. Island after island was seized almost as far as Hawaii. Our crippled Navy battled the enemy's far larger fleet at every opportunity. The losses were heavy. The enemy kept coming. The weary men on our ships waited desperately for help to come from the States. But for seven long months, no help came. In the shambles of Pearl Harbor, morale was at the low point of the entire war. But then, late on the afternoon of July the 11th, 1942, the crews of the battle-scarred ships then at Pearl looked seaward and saw a beautiful sight. The newest, biggest, most powerful battleship in the world had finally arrived. Forerunner of all the ships and planes and men yet to come. Attention to port. And salute. Two. All over Pearl Harbor, the men began to cheer. The first step in the long and bloody way to Tokyo was the marine landings on Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. And the North Carolina was there. As part of the supporting naval task force, she was assigned to escort the aircraft carrier Enterprise. 
this was a new mission for a battleship taking advantage of her speed and her impressive anti aircraft firepower she was soon to be put to her first test the battle of the eastern solomons here's one of the men who was there i was the air defense officer in charge of the anti-aircraft uh, batteries uh, this was my battle station we had over 100 anti-aircraft guns and the finest fire control system in the world. We were capable of firing about uh, 25,000 rounds per minute. Of course, it took good men as well as good guns to do that. A powerful Japanese naval force, including two aircraft carriers, was on its way to deliver reinforcements to Guadalcanal. 80 Japanese carrier aircraft were launched to attack the Enterprise and North Carolina. This was to be the showboats, baptism of fire. naval anti-aircraft fire yet witnessed. The battle lasted uh, about eight minutes. We shot down from seven to 14 enemy planes and frustrated the attacks of many others. So the North Carolina proved herself in her first battle and established the role of the fast battleship as protector of the aircraft carrier. She continued her patrolling near the Solomons operating with the carriers Saratoga, Hornet, and Wasp. By mid-September, there had been persistent reports of Japanese submarines in the area. A man who was on watch as officer of the deck recalls what happened next. I was here on the bridge on watch. The aircraft carrier Wasp was approximately five miles away, forward of our port beam. She had just completed recovery of aircraft. Suddenly we realized Wasp was a fire. We didn't know why, but we were soon to find out. Torpedo just passed the stern of me, headed for you. Right full runner. All engines ahead of emergency. Sound general quarters. Aye, aye, sir. Rudder's right full, sir. struck us contained a highly explosive charge. It blew a hole in the hull through which it could drive a large truck. 
Yet, during those awful minutes after the torpedo hit, the North Carolina went right up to 25 knots and never left her station in the formation. She had to go back to Pearl Harbor for repairs, but the showboat and her crew had shown that they could take it as well as dish it out. Here is a man who lived through all this and more. I was the executive officer, the second in command of the captain. This job took me all over the ship, so I was more or less responsible for everything and everybody on board. My battle station was in Battle 2 up the mast, and from there I maneuvered the ship, or what the Navy called had the con, whenever we went into combat. The North Carolina was in action about 50 times, but at no time did she fight the type of action for which she was intended. These 16-inch guns were to slug it out with enemy battleships at ranges up to about 20 miles. However, World War II changed all of this. From the beginning, our primary mission was to protect our carriers from Japanese air attack. We were able to do this with our superb anti-aircraft battery. And we had enough speed to keep up with the carriers. We had a great crew with a splendid spirit. It was the finest crew with which I have ever served. There was nothing that they could not do better and faster than any other ship of the fleet. In November 1943, with the campaign for the Solomons nearly over, we began our major offensive across the Central Pacific this started with the recapture of Tarawa and Macon in the Gilbert Islands. And again, the North Carolina was there. Then came the formation of Task Force 58, soon to become the most powerful naval force ever assembled. The North Carolina was a charter member of this famous force which was to sweep irresistibly across the Pacific, spearheading the island-hopping campaigns that followed. The next operation was against the Marshall Islands, where our carrier-based planes and the guns of our ships again softened the defenses preparatory to the Marine and Army landings. The showboat bombarded Kwajalein Atoll throughout the night and all the next day. Such bombardments were directed from the plotting room. Here is the man who actually controlled the guns. I was the gunnery officer of this great ship. This is the plotting room. We are far below decks and protected by armor. These are computers which solve the problems of aiming the guns. When I squeeze this trigger, the guns fire. Of course, there is a lot more to it than that.
time as a navigator and third in command particularly remember an episode off the philippines where we were supporting general carter's landings and we were normally fueling our destroyers every three or four days and we had commenced this procedure when we made the discovery we were headed into the very center of a violent typhoon in a very short order the wind had built up to over a hundred miles an hour torrents of rain coming down tons of water crashing down on the folks in fact we couldn't even see the bow of the ship and the showboat was rolling 30 degrees on the side and uh, every time we slammed down on one of these enormous waves the whole ship would shudder just like a wet doll i hung in this pilot house here for a, a day and a night no sleep listening to the cries of uh, distress coming from the various ships the small carriers for example had uh, planes breaking loose on the hangar deck gasoline tanks ruptured fires breaking out repeatedly but the ones who were in real trouble were the destroyers out of fuel riding high flying over on their beam ends hanging there Sometimes the message was cut off in the middle. We wondered what the answer was. We found out the next morning. There was some damage to the North Carolina. Their planes were damaged on the after deck, but the real damage was the destroyers. Three were sunk, capsized, rolled over. 800 people lost. It was the worst disaster the task force had ever encountered. But even the typhoon could not stop the momentum of our offensive. In early 1945, the fast carrier task force, by now the greatest naval striking force the world had ever seen, was racing north to strike Tokyo. The force now totaled 110 ships, including 16 fast carriers with 1,250 combat aircraft. The ship formation was 96 miles long. Over 100,000 men rode those ships, the carrier launch point was reached after an all-night run at high speed. At dawn, hundreds of Navy planes filled the skies over Japan to begin a day and a half of battle aimed at destroying the Japanese air power in the Tokyo area. This first major carrier strike on Japan destroyed over 500 aircraft in the air and on the ground. But even that great victory did not end the war. It merely meant that we could advance one stepping stone closer to the enemy homeland. That next stepping stone was an ugly little island called Iwo Jima. Over 20,000 crack Japanese soldiers were to fight to their deaths defending this island. It bristled with tough defenses and was honeycombed with caves and tunnels. Three Marine divisions were landed to capture Iwo in the bloodiest fighting of the war in the Pacific. One of those Marines tells what it was like. As a platoon commander in the 5th Tank Battalion, 5th Marine Division, I made the assault landing on D-Day on Iwo Jima. The mission of our unit was to move across the island, execute a right turn, and clear that portion of the island of enemy resistance. This appeared to be a relatively simple and easy task. However, I was about to find out that I was to witness the most intense fighting that I would see in this war and in two future wars.
times our Marines could not advance without accurate direct fire support. And this we received from the USS North Carolina. Time and time again, she's fired a round of this size right into the mouth of many a cave. And I might add, with devastating results. We thought she was super. Combat Information Center. I was the fighter director officer and I used to stand right here facing air plot on which we tracked in hundreds of enemy aircraft. Once we detected them on our radars, the carriers would send out their fighters to intercept the enemy. I often controlled some of those planes, giving the pilots their directions over this radio telephone. Vector 350 Buster. Angels 15 over. This is Brownie 5, Vector 350 Buster. We'll go out. Tally ho, 6 6. the ship's gunners to stop those kamikazes. It was either them or us. Hundreds of them came out in a desperate last-ditch effort to destroy us by destroying themselves.
North Carolina fought in the fiery crucible that was Okinawa. But Okinawa was her last great battle. Victory came soon afterwards, and the showboat, veteran of nearly 50 separate engagements, had helped every step of the way, from Guadalcanal to the shores of a defeated Japan. On September the 2nd, 1945, the Japanese surrendered on board the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, and the war was over. World War II was won. The North Carolina came home to a hero's welcome. But a nation at peace soon mothballed her in the reserve fleet until she was too old to serve at sea. And now... Seven hundred thousand school children have already given nickels, dimes, and quarters. And in every county of the state, thousands of North Carolinians have contributed toward the cost of bringing her home to Wilmington. Thank you. 